Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast, episode number 219. You know, I get a huge amount of satisfaction when I share with you here on the Genealogy Gems podcast and when it impacts your research and it helps you. It nudges me on when you guys take the time to write me an email and tell me what you've learned, what's made a difference to you. And I read every single email. I want to continue to impact your research and your enjoyment of this fascinating hobby and also to reach and help others who perhaps have had a twinge of curiosity about their family history now and then, but had no idea how to do it, or even frankly, what difference it makes. Maybe you're one of those people, and someone you know encouraged you to take a listen to this episode. Thank you for taking them up on it, and I promise you, you won't be disappointed. In this episode, I'm going to tell you a story today. It's a story that one of my gems emailed me about, In fact, the first time she emailed me was about a year ago, and I kept the email. And over the course of the last year, I've really had a desire to kind of stretch my creativity with a new sort of format. And frankly, over time, I've become kind of obsessed with wanting to do this. Now, we do a lot around here at Genealogy Gems, so I just just wasn't sure how we were going to fit this in. And then just as I was kind of lamenting that I hadn't found the time, I got another email a follow-up to the story, and it was clearly my signal to get this done. And I'm so glad I did. I thoroughly enjoyed creating today's episode. And here's what I'm hoping that you'll get out of it. First, I hope that you will be thoroughly entertained. Yes, entertained. Give yourself permission to just kick back and let the story unfold. And secondly, as you go on this journey... Listen for ideas and things that you could use yourself, whether you're brand new to the idea of researching your family or whether you've been doing this for decades, there are gems in this episode to be mined today. Because my friends, genealogy isn't just dusty old documents and fragments of information that really don't matter to your life today. In fact, my guest, Julianne Mangin, will make a very compelling case for that. Genealogy is a riveting puzzle. It's a path of twists and turns, and it has a powerful potential to also be a healing tool. Even if sometimes it's a bit like pulling teeth to get someone to take a look or a listen to genealogy. In fact, there's some teeth pulling in our story today. Enjoy. stories. We all have them, passed around the dinner table, over the phone, and in hushed voices around the corner of a doorway. When we are children, they come from the mouths of our elders, which cements them firmly as told. No deviations, because after all, they were told by grown-ups. And some of those stories aren't really stories at all, just fragments, really, juicy pieces of gossip, or bottom lines that are meant to explain away the past and firmly place a period at the end. No more discussion. Julianne Mangin had heard stories like these all of her life, mostly from her mom. The stories of how her grandmother and grandfather married in 1922, and then two months later, Grandma left Grandpa. And then, of course, the story of Grandma's ten years committed to a mental institution. Yes, they were fragments, really, more than complete stories. Julianne's mother was the family historian, and when pressed for details, well, it was a little bit like pulling teeth. Oh, 
And yes, there was that story about Julianne's great-grandfather abandoning her great-grandmother, and then she was committed to a mental institution, and then they pulled out all of her teeth. Julianne's mom was the genealogist of the family, and by all appearances, had all of those census records, birth certificates, and other dry documents firmly in hand. And as for asking for more details on those unusual and mysterious stories, well, that was a bit like pulling teeth, too. Julianne's family was an entangled web of lies, pain, loss, and madness. On her website, JulianneManjin.com, she describes it as, quote, a Dickens tale of immigration, poverty, mental illness, family betrayal, and ultimately, redemption. In this episode of the Genealogy Gems podcast, we're going to unravel the story of how madness in a family nearly buried the truth of the family's history, and how bringing that truth out into the light brought with it healing and created a passionate new genealogist. Along the way, you'll hear some of the strategies that Julianne used to find that truth. Methods that just may help you to flush out the true details of one of your family's stories. Like so many children of genealogists, Julianne Mangin really didn't see a need to cover territory that she thought her mother had well in hand. Well, at least she appeared to. Well, I came up with the term of reluctant genealogist for myself because mom was very avid about it, and I just didn't get the point of her genealogical research. Um, She was like collecting all this data. But she was also at the same time telling these family stories, and there was a disconnect for me. It's like, well, I have a lot of questions about her stories, and she's doing all this research, and none of her research illuminated the stories. Over the many years she did genealogy, I never heard her stories change one iota. So I was thinking, well, genealogy is very dry, and you just gather facts, and it doesn't really you know, tell you anything about your family. I mean, that's what I thought genealogy was. And on top of that, when I did question my mom about things that didn't make sense to me, she would give me a lot of pushback. Like, um, I think I mentioned somewhere in the story, I say that mom would tell me that she was raised by her mother who became mentally ill. And so then at a young age, she had to go into the county home because her father, for some reason, didn't want to take care of her or didn't take care of her. You know, it's a very sad Dickensian kind of story about her childhood, but then she'd swear that Grandpa was the best father ever. And I'd say, but Ma, you didn't see him for 10 years when you were a child. How could he be so great? And that kind of thing, I would get a lot of pushback about that, and I got to the point where I'm like, okay whatever. I just felt like mom owned these family stories and I wasn't allowed to question them or interpret them. And I didn't see genealogy as a way that she filled in the blanks of the story for me. So I was, like I said, a reluctant genealogist because I didn't see how it would have benefited me. And so Julianne really didn't get involved with genealogy even though she worked at the Library of Congress, an enviable job in the eyes of most genealogists. She had the vast resources of America's oldest library at her feet. But perhaps it was that job at the Library of Congress that led Julianne reluctantly to genealogy after all. Well, I started family history research at first by just helping mom. 
for many years, I was a librarian at the Library of Congress, which is a great place for genealogy research if you're into it. So mom would send me to get information for as long as I was down there, you know. I would um, take a break from work and I'd go over to the local history and genealogy reading room and look up things for her. And I could see that she was working with like 19th century ancestors of her father. And so it only confirmed to me, okay, she's gone that far back in her genealogical research and she hasn't learned anything that's changed her stories. So again, I wasn't that interested in it. Toward the end of 2011, after Julianne retired from the Library of Congress and her father had passed away, her mother, growing more frail, was on the verge of a move due to her health. And with that came the all-important question. What would become of all the boxes of genealogical research that her mother had amassed? Dad had passed away, and she was in an assisted living, and her dementia was getting worse. And Well, actually, she wasn't in assisted living yet, but we had to move her from an independent living apartment to assisted living. And what that meant was these huge boxes of genealogical stuff had to go somewhere. And so I volunteered to take it because I had room and I lived nearby. But I had no intention of doing anything with it, but I was saving it for whoever in the family wanted to be the genealogist, not realizing it was going to be me. But what were in all those boxes? Certainly after so many years of research and with all that paper, they must contain answers to many of the lingering family questions. Or did they? So I thought, well, maybe I should look in these boxes because they're taking up a lot of room in my basement and maybe I can consolidate them. So I start doing that. And then I'm sort of mystified because things are all like cluttered and mixed up. And so this happened within six months of my retirement. And of course, I had a lot of free time. And at the Library of Congress, I used to work on websites and databases. So I thought, well, this is my wheelhouse. I'm going to just take this stuff and I'm going to organize this data and still thinking I'm you know, going to pass it on to someone else in the family when they were interested, but it was like this slippery slope. The more I looked at it, the more I thought, wait a minute, mom's like research methods were kind of questionable. And what I found over the years, the more I got into it and I got more relentless about being a family historian, I realized she somehow managed to avoid all the people who could have cracked open some of the family secrets. Ah, And there were many, many family secrets to crack open. But it takes a certain kind of researcher to do so. In the Manjin family, there were two different kinds of genealogists. One, Julianne's mom, who appeared to be looking for the proof to go with her stories. And the other, Julianne, who wanted the evidence to lead her. Because that is where the truth lies. Coming up, the turning point where our reluctant genealogist said, Okay, I'm all in. As I travel the world talking about genealogy, folks are always stopping me and asking for my advice on organizing and securing their family history research. And my standard answer is plant your family tree in your own backyard and share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard, it means keeping one master family tree in a software file right there on your own computer. That gives you ownership, control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. And of course, my software of choice and the one that I use is Roots Magic. I find that its tree building tools are second to none. And with Roots Magic web hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And now you have the ability to synchronize your Roots Magic database with your ancestry tree and get those ancestry.com web hints right there inside of Roots Magic. These are features that are really critical and they're exclusive to Roots Magic. So plant your tree today 
in Roots Magic and watch it grow. Get started at rootsmagic.com. Like many of us, Julianne Mangin had never planned to become a genealogist. But after inheriting her mother's genealogical paperwork, her librarian organizational skills kicked in, and she started going through the boxes. Her first step was to enter the data found in that paperwork into a genealogy database software program. There's something very special that happens when we enter our data into a database. The power of the data is revealed, and new revelations come to light. When I started doing this data entry into a genealogy software program, and again, I was still, oh, I'm just organizing this for somebody else. And, you know, I was very comfortable with database software, having worked in IT in my library career. But then after I had put a great deal of names in there and birth dates and death dates and marriage dates, as you know, I saw that it offered a feature where you could sort by dates, like sort by, you know, birth date and sort by marriage date, and then also sort by death date. And when I did the one sort by death date, I was like, wait a minute, some of these people were alive when I was a child and I never met them. What's up with that? I have great, great aunt who died in 1980 when I was 24 and I had never heard of her, and I never met her. And then I realized there's some kind of rift going on that I don't know about, but this was clear evidence that there was some avoidance going on and that I wanted to get to the bottom of it. Mom's aunt was named Pauline Meddy, and Mom was named after her. She died in 1970 when I was 14 or 15. Mom was named after her. I never met her. I mean, these kinds of things shocked me that I had family members that for some reason I was being kept away from. Then I was just like, all right, I'm going to find out who these people are and what they know. Of course, these people were dead. But then I went and searched for living relatives, and I found a first cousin twice removed. She's still alive today. She's 92 and she is sharp as a tack. And she told me a lot of what I needed to know. And there was much that Julianne wanted to know. Answers to questions that her mom wasn't forthcoming with. Growing up with her mom wasn't easy for Julianne. There were behaviors and tensions that were painful, and she yearned to better understand her mom's upbringing in hopes of better understanding her own. But behaviors and personalities are a lot like our DNA. They go deeper back into the family tree than we might expect. Julianne's investigation into her mom's upbringing led to a need to understand her grandmother's upbringing, which led to records that contained a shocking surprise and ultimately brought her to a set of great-grandparents who were shrouded in mystery and madness. I thought, I, I want to know what happened to mom when she was a child, what really happened, because her stories were so contradictory, I felt there was something missing. And so right away, I thought, you know, where I would get a lot of information would be if I got a hold of grandma's patient record from the state hospital where she'd been a patient for 10 years. And believe it or not, they gave it to me. And not only that, the State Archives of Connecticut said, uh, by the way, there are three other family members of yours who are patients here. You want those records, too. And I was like, yeah. So one of them was my great-grandmother, Graziella Medi. Graziella Medi and her husband, Philippe. These are the central characters of the abandonment and pulling teeth story fragment. Julianne was very fortunate to have obtained Graziella's patient records, as access to mental institution records can be hard to gain and varies greatly by institution and location. 
You may recall the obstacles that author Steve Luxenberg faced that he shared with us in Genealogy Gems podcast episodes 120 and 121. But Julianne's success not only in finding and obtaining her grandmother's records, but unbelievably also the records of three other relatives, should be an encouragement to anyone who has hesitated to make the effort for fear of failure. May I say that when I started my research and I was thinking, I need to write about this, but who writes about this level of insanity in a family? And then I just happened to start listening to your podcast and you were interviewing Steve Luxenberg and I was overjoyed. I'm like, it's a thing. People do this. And uh, I even contacted him, and uh, he was very nice and answered my question. So I just wanted to say that much to you, that um, this is one way in which your podcast helped me a great deal. The first thing I did was I got Graziella's patient record from Norwich State Hospital in Connecticut and found out that she had been admitted there in 1908. And I also looked at the records and noticed that the leap had visited her and written letters to the superintendent all while she was a patient there. So that was already one piece of mom's story that just wasn't true. The other thing that I did was study the history of psychiatric care in the United States during that time period and found out that, indeed, at one point they thought that insanity was caused by infections in the teeth, and if you pulled them out, that that would cure insanity. When I got over being upset and sad about what happened to my ancestors, it was a fun ride to say, oh, you know, this thing mom said was true, or at least now I know where it came from, and this thing, oh, I've totally upended another thing that I always thought was true. And, uh, you know, it was an adventure for me. It was like solving a very long puzzle. So how do you go about breaking down a very long puzzle into manageable, bite-sized pieces or steps? Well, one of the first things to do is look at what you have. In Juliana's case, what she inherited from her mom. And try to identify the source of the information. Consider the art world. Knowing the provenance of a piece is crucial to understanding its value. Provenance looks at an object's origins, history, and ownership, and these can shed light on whether the piece is authentic. Juliana wisely took the time to consider the provenance of the genealogical data that she now possessed. One of the important things that I did was every once in a while to say, now, how would mom know this? How old was she? Who was her source? And a lot of time the answer was, you know, She probably heard this from her mother. Mm -hmm. She was probably about eight. And her mother was a paranoid schizophrenic. So that same fragmentation that characterizes the disease of schizophrenia might have come out in the storytelling in that mom got these stories from her mother. And her mother was a difficult person. She didn't like contradictions, so mom just took everything verbatim and never questioned it. After looking through the information that she received from her mom and evaluating the accuracy by digging into the sources that she had used, Julianne took to the net to figure out if and where the records for the Norwich, Connecticut State Hospital were archived. The first thing I did was, of course, I Googled it and something popped up on my screen that the records from Norwich State Hospital were held at the State Archives. And so I contacted them. And every state is different in the way that they allow access to records. And apparently, Connecticut is somewhat more open, although they do protect the records in the sense that I had to send proof that I was descended from a patient. So I sent my grandmother's death certificate and my mother's birth certificate and my birth certificate and just established that I was a direct descendant of my grandmother, Beatrice, who I knew was a patient there. And then they came back to me and said, well, it's something that we do. We let you know that there are other family members who are also patients. And um, 
they told me there were three other people in my family who were also patients, so I got their records too. Now, I have such an incidence of mental illness in my family. There was another great aunt of mine, my grandmother's sister, who was at a state hospital in New York, and I got a totally different response from them. First of all, they had a form letter that said that there's such a stigma connected to mental illness that they for privacy reasons, don't want to reveal who was a patient there. They also said that that right of privacy in their eyes didn't end with the death of the patient. And then further they said, and we don't release records for purely genealogical purposes. So basically it was no three ways from Sunday, as they say. And that's the challenge. Many archives of these types of records of hospitals long since closed down perpetuate the sense of shame and secrecy around mental illness. The irony is that in shedding light on it, it can help current and future generations identify trends that exist in the family's health history. It's a bit like the monster in the closet that we feared as children. In the dark, The monster's size was only limited by our imagination. And yet when the lights are switched on and the closet door swings open, proportion is returned. In Family Trees, truth can help us gain a balanced perspective and often empathy. We begin to realize that these were just human people like us, trying to survive and doing their best with the hand that they were dealt In my own experience, the truth doesn't excuse bad behavior or wrongs that were perpetrated, and it doesn't necessarily heal broken relationships, but it does have a healing power. The truth demystifies things and puts them in their proper context. Truth combined with genealogy ensures that we aren't just left with the memories that were left behind from the immense imagination of an eight-year-old who was listening around the corner. I think it's very important that I tell my family story because I think I can show it as an example of this is how someone uses this kind of knowledge and it improves their lives or helps them understand themselves better. It's just psychologically better to know where you're really from and what really happened before you, and I'm hoping that it will serve as a proof of the benefit of opening things up. And I'm sure there's other reasons why these records ought to be made open, but I'm putting forth my example. Coming up next... Julianne shares the heartbreaking story of her great-grandparents, Graziella and Philippe Medi, French Canadians who were part of the massive wave of 900,000 immigrants in the 19th century from Quebec to New England. And she'll explain how she unraveled a baffling household in the census and how newspapers revealed the rest of the story. Okay, have you visited backblaze.com slash Lisa yet? If you don't have cloud backup for your computer yet, everything on it is vulnerable to loss. Your pictures, your master genealogy database, files for work, the everyday business of your household, losing all of that at once is as devastating as it sounds. That's why I did my homework and I found a cloud-based backup service provider. I chose Backblaze. It runs in the background 24-7 automatically saving copies of everything, including my precious video files. Did you know that some of the other leading services actually skip your video files when they do the backup? Hello, not good. And Backblaze is so easy to use. I love their free app that allows me to access all my files if I need to from my smartphone or my tablet. 
Most importantly, the service is totally affordable for real people. It's just $5 a month. So don't wait to ensure that all your files are safe. Do it now. Back them up like I do with Backblaze. Head over to backblaze.com slash Lisa and get that $5 a month deal. Check it out for yourself. You could even do a free trial. That's backblaze.com slash Lisa. Welcome back. The story of Graziella and Philippe Metti was what first caught my eye at Julianne Mangin's blog at julianmangin.com. The tragic tale with its surprises along the way was tantalizing enough, but the real intrigue for me was from a genealogical point of view. The confusing records and the fascinating news accounts that help shed light on them. Philippe was born in Quebec in 1877. Uh, His parents were David Meddy and Rosalie Lapointe. Philippe had a lot of siblings. I think he was one of like nine or ten children, which was very typical for a French-Canadian Catholic family. Philippe's occupation was the spinner in a mill. And the mill was in Danielson, Connecticut, which is in the northeast corner of the state. When I realized that he was a weaver and then I did some more research on French Canadians and New England, it turns out that the Medi family was part of this huge wave of migration from Quebec to New England to work in the textile mills. I think the statistic that everybody quotes is between 1840 and 1930, 900,000 people from Quebec moved to New England to work in the mills mainly. And that's a huge demographic movement that I had no idea about, and here I am part of it. I'm the result of it. Graziella's maiden name was Bonneau, and her parents were Pierre and Isilda Bonneau. Pierre and Isilda lived in Quebec, and Graziella was born in Quebec in 1878, and they migrated to Danielson in 1885. And then the Meddy family, obviously, they also migrated to Danielson, and that's how Philippe and Graziella met in Danielson. When Graziella and Philippe married, they were about 20. It was 1899, and I believe they both started out working at the Quinnebog Mill in Danielson. And in fact, in the 1900 U.S. Census, they're both designated as mill workers in Danielson. And they hadn't had any children yet. And then she started having children. My grandmother, Beatrice, was her first child born in 1901. And then she just started having more babies. And I think they were very, very poor. And this takes me to my mother's other cryptic stories, which was that she said that as a child, her mother grew up in a shed. They had been living in their own little apartment, and they're having more and more children, and I think that their financial situation got more desperate, so they decided that they needed to move in with her parents, Pierre and Isilda. So then I thought to myself, oh, that must be where this shed was that mom used to talk about. So when I used the Sanborn maps to locate where this shed actually was, And then I looked at the census date and I said, now who would have been living in that household at the same time that Philippe and their three children (laughs) are moving in? And also looking at how small the house was, there were like eight people living in this tiny house already. And then I think, well, of course they had to move in the shed. There was nowhere else for them. And so it made me appreciate the desperation of their situation and the situation my grandmother grew up in. I could go on a whole tangent about how you use Sanborn maps to find where the shed was, realize it was still standing, and I went up to Danielson and I stood inside that shed. By finding where my grandmother started and by 
you know, understanding how poor she was and, you know, the fact that she had been raised in the shed, I felt like by finding it and standing in it, I was honoring her experience and that it was really important for me to do that. I feel like there's some sort of spiritual karma that comes along with being someone who acknowledges another person's suffering, even if they've passed away. I think it's still important to remember and acknowledge it. Losing their home, living in poverty in a shed on Graziella's parents' property, having more children and suffering the loss of others, Julianne could see in the records Philippe and Graziella's situation was growing more desperate. It sort of was culminating into a perfect storm. And then, for whatever reason, while they were living in the shed, Graziella had her first psychotic break. And then another one around 1908. Apparently, there was a fire. And then she also had a miscarriage in very close proximity. And then she kind of lost it mentally. And that's when Philippe had to make the difficult decision about getting her somewhere where she could get help or at least ensuring the safety of his children because he could now no longer just leave them in her care because she was mentally ill. The loss of their mother to mental illness was just the first loss of a parent that the children faced. Soon, Philippe had a decision to make about if and how he would ensure their care. Julianne turned to the census to tell her the next chapter of the story. Philippe moved out, and in the 1910 census, he's living with his parents. And I couldn't find the children in the 1910 census in Danielson. I didn't know where they were. According to the Norwich State Hospital records that Julianne had obtained, at this point, Graziella's mother, Azilda, steps in to assess the situation. The the short story is, at one point, Azilda writes to the uh, hospital. She says, I've got more than I can handle here. I need to know if you think that Graziella is ever going to get better and come out. And the answer was not good. So the children were actually sent away to New Hampshire to live with Azilda's brother. This is another example of my mother's ignoring records that didn't match up with the story she knew. Because I very easily found my grandmother in New Hampshire, and I think my mother saw that record and decided that couldn't be her because she'd never been told she lived in New Hampshire. And so what happened was I remember being in the assisted living apartment with my mother when I made this discovery, and I said, Mom, did you know that your mother lived in New Hampshire when she was a child? And she says, no, she didn't. And that was it. And and I was kind of unsure because at first I didn't know who this guy was. His name was uh, Hercule d'Avignon. And I'm thinking, who is this guy? And then I went, wait a minute, Azilda's maiden name was d'Avignon. And I had not looked at her siblings. So that sent me on this whole genealogical chase where I found all of her siblings and realized, oh, yeah, that was her brother. So Philippe now doesn't have his children. His in-laws are taking care of them. He's got a wife in the state hospital who does not have an optimistic diagnosis for getting better. And then, in December of 1910, Graziella passed away. Unfortunately, she died um, in December of 1910. One of the problems was she was not a cooperative patient, and even though she could speak English, apparently she refused to speak anything but French, and I don't think the hospital knew what to do with her. Her situation deteriorated, according to them, because she couldn't or wouldn't tell them what was going on with her. It was very sad that she died there. I remember feeling very crushed about it, because even though I I knew it was coming as I was working on writing the story, I feel like I'm living it. And then I just was devastated to learn what a lonely death she had. On the other hand, I have to say in Philippe's defense, um, he brought a priest to her a day or two before she died. So, so much for him abandoning her. And then he just disappears. That is until Julianne digs into the 1920 U.S. federal census. At that point, I was looking for any medis I could find. 
my genealogical approach was, you know, let's go year by year and look for everybody we can that has the same last name. So I was looking for other people at the time. And then up comes this record for a Philip in the census, the way it was spelled, Maddie, in Maynard, Massachusetts. I was like, wow, he's the same age as my great grandfather and he has the same occupation. But I don't recognize his wife or his child. And I noticed that the one child that was enumerated with him in that census was between the ages of two of Philippe's children. So I thought, this can't be right. This probably isn't him. It just started gnawing at me. So I decided I would just go out and try to prove who this Philip Meddy was and differentiate him from my Philippe Meddy. So let's stop for a moment and look at this Medi household in the 1920 U.S. federal census. They're living in Maynard, Massachusetts, and there's Philip D. Medi. Now, he's the head of the household. He's 42 years old, and he's single. Listed under him, using the same surname, is Marie E. She's listed as the wife, 31 years old, from Connecticut. The child listed in the household uses the same surname. He's 14 years old, and his name is Charles D., also born in Connecticut. The one thing that struck me was that he said he was single. Uh, That was very interesting, but then Marie says she's the wife of the head of household, which is Philip, so that was a little curious. But it did strike me that I couldn't find Philippe anywhere else Although the family lore was that when Philippe left, he went back to Canada. So I was just very confused looking at that record, but also intrigued and thinking, well, here's another puzzle I can solve. What in the world was going on in Maynard, Massachusetts in 1920? And what did Julianne do to unravel this mystery? When I looked at that record and saw Philippe being single and Marie saying she was his wife, and then that child, I thought, maybe Philippe had a secret family. But then it was 1920, and Graziella died in 1910. Well, maybe he remarried, and he started a new family, and this child who's the same age as his own children with Graziella, maybe he adopted this kid and then gave him his last name. I mean, I was trying to see, how is this possible Uh, But I knew it really boiled down to finding out if there was a marriage between Philippe and this Marie E, as she was listed in the census. The approach I took to solve this problem was to not chase after a conclusion, but to pretty much search all the possible areas. So it was like, well, what if Philippe really did go back to Canada if he remarried? the Quebec church records should have a record of them. And so that was one thing I thought I would do. And the other thing was to look in uh, Massachusetts vital records and see if there was a marriage there. But what was curious to me was that I came up zero on both of them. I know trying to search for someone named Marie, especially among French Canadians, is really (laughs) ridiculous. There are just so many people named Marie, but I didn't turn any more records up about Elite Medi either, so I was sort of uh, puzzled what to do next at that point. Julianne's strategy was this, try to find Marie E. and Charles D. in some other family group in 1910, back when she knew that her Philippe was still married to Graziella, and she knew where he was living. If she could find the right Marie E. and Charles D. in another household with a Philip Meddy in 1910, then she could be certain that the Philip Meddy in the Maynard 1920 census with Marie and Charles was not her great-grandfather, Philippe Meddy. So what did she have to work with? Marie E., born about 1888, and a son, Charles D. On the surface, doesn't look like much. But in actuality, though the names may be common, the combination of those names, places, and ages makes them very unique. And that's what Julianne was searching for. I took a gamble, I guess I thought, but when you think about it, 
what's a gamble, you know, in genealogical research? You try something and it either proves your point or you eliminate some possibility that now you don't have to follow anymore. So what I did was I searched for Marie E. and Charles D. in the um, 1910 census, and I limited their location to Danielson, Connecticut thinking, well, that's a start, and if that doesn't work, I'll get broader and maybe do Wyndham County or whatever. I would slowly broaden it, but, you know, I felt like, well, the farther I broaden it geographically, the less chance there's going to be that I'll find the right family. But, fortunately for me, just limiting it to Danielson, Connecticut, I got a family group with the two of them, and they were living with a man whose last name was Medi. But it wasn't Philip, it wasn't Philippe, it was George. And that turned out to be Philippe's brother. <laughs> the Medi story had so many twists and turns. And at first glance, it looked like Philippe and Marie didn't quite tell the truth to the census taker. You know, it's tempting to think that ancestors were fudging when we see records that at first glance just don't seem to add up. And yet, Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction, and what you are looking at is technically correct. It was so fun to chat with Julianne about this case. What I love about this is you can go back and then look at that census, which of course we'll have a copy of the clipping of that in the show notes. And Philip and Marie and Charles actually very accurately described exactly who they were. There, were, mm-hmm. there was no misleading because Marie's last name was Medi. So there's right. a line, right? And yeah. she says, I am a wife. Correct. <laughs> and Philip is like, yep, I'm a Medi. I'm single. And I also <laughs> am the head of this household. I love that they were so completely honest. And yet it was baffling when you first look at it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was. The other thing that was interesting about that situation when I finally found this record with George Medi and Marie and Charles was that I had already researched all of Philippe's siblings. So immediately I go back to my database and look for um, George again. And sure enough, he's got a wife named Marie E. and a son named Charles D. And I was like, this is amazing. And did you feel like you had stumbled into another family secret? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I believe that this situation with Philippe and leaving... Danielson with George's wife and child was a a shameful secret that um, the family didn't want the children to know. And I think that's why they just said to the kids, oh, he went back to Canada. I think that was a cover story for something they were very ashamed about. Well, and also I would imagine that saying, oh, he went back to Canada, it puts a nice big period on the end of that sentence. It says, don't look for him. We're not Mm -hmm. associating with him. He's a non-issue at this point. So it doesn't even leave kind of any openings for children to go wandering and looking years down the road. Yes, yes, that's true. Philippe is now living a new life with his brother's family. And this begs the question, where is Philippe's brother, George? What happened to him? And why did Marie bring Philippe into her home? I decided to research George Meddy further because... It's not enough to say that Philippe ran off with Marie and Charles. I I really wanted to know why. And this is where I got very hooked on uh, doing genealogical research. There are now digitized sources out there that can help you answer questions like that. I found George in the newspaper. I think it was in 1913. Um, He he had... um, exposed himself to some girls headed for church one day, and he was arrested and put in jail. And the other thing is I found a couple of other reports. You know, this is what's so great about local papers back then. Everything was reported, you know, from who had lunch with who on a certain day to who's in jail and so forth. But he had a number of scrapes with the law, and one of them was that he was selling liquor illegally. And another, he was in a card game with one of his companions, and they got in an argument, and he broke the guy's jaw. So I discovered that George was not a good person. He was a pervert, and he was violent. And I could certainly see 
uh, Marie wanting to get away. And when George was locked up for the one charge, it made a perfect opportunity for her to get out of town and Philippe offered to help. So I asked Julianne, what were her feelings about our main character, Philippe, at this point? The many things that I learned about him, I think this is one of his shining moments where he helped somebody and it was a good thing. Uh, It's sad that he had abandoned his children in the process, but on the other hand, his children were well cared for by his in-laws, Azilda and Pierre, and then later their daughter, Rose, also raised the children. So they weren't without a family. It's just that every daughter really wants to know that her father loves her. And my grandmother didn't get that from Philippe. In just a moment, the epilogue to our story. Julianne shares how George wasn't the only Medi to make the news and the tragic ending to George, Marie, and Philippe. Finally, you'll hear why Julianne believes that stories like Graziella and Philippe's explain the addictive and healing power of genealogy. Meet me this fall in the genealogy capital of the world, Utah. The Genealogy Gems team will be all yours in person for a very special Genealogy Roots conference. It's like Roots Tech, fantastic learning sessions, a short distance from the Family History Library, without the crowds, having to switch rooms, or miss any of your favorite classes. For two full days, I'll be sharing the stage with your DNA guide, Diane Southerd, and Genealogy Gems contributing editor, Sonny Morton. And you will have a unique interactive experience with us. Admission includes a fantastic lineup of inspiring sessions designed to have something for all skill levels, an ebook of session handouts, and special prize giveaways that you don't find at typical conferences. So whether you live in Utah or you can plan a visit, we hope to meet you in person on Thursday and Friday, October 4th and 5th of 2018 at the Genealogy Roots Conference in Sandy, Utah. To learn more or to get registered, visit genealogygems.com slash Utah. Our sponsor for this episode is MyHeritage, which has over 70 million members worldwide. If you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, MyHeritage is the place that you want to be. Post your tree on MyHeritage and start to see the magic as they automatically match it up with other trees, not just with genealogists in the country where you live, but around the world. Trees aren't primary sources, but they are excellent leads. I uploaded a portion of my family tree that contains my German heritage, and that's where I was really hoping to make a breakthrough, and very quickly it happened. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany. That was my first international cousin contact. But there's more at MyHeritage. Their unique and powerful search system, it's called Record Matches. It constantly calls over 5 billion historical records for your family. It's the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. It is also the first to translate names between languages. Find out what MyHeritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. On the brink of a new century, Julianne Mangin's grandmother's mother 
Graziella Beno married Philippe Medi in 1899, and following a series of devastating occurrences culminating in a mental break, she was institutionalized at the State Hospital in Norwich, Connecticut. Following Graziella's death, her children are put in the care of her mother, Azilda's relatives. And Graziella's husband, Philippe, he's moved in with his brother's wife, Marie, who's escaped her husband, George, who's been incarcerated for indecent exposure, violence, and bootlegging. But as Julianne found in the newspapers, George was not the only troubled Medi. I did find an interesting story about Philippe in one of the digitized newspapers from 1910 while Graziella was still alive but locked up in Norwich State Hospital. And it was a story of Philippe's arrest in Norwich for stealing a necklace. And at the time, he was in the company of another woman. So I think even before Graziella died, I think that her parents... Pierre and Isilda were starting to turn against him because not only was he misbehaving, but it was in all the papers. I feel lucky as a genealogist for two things, and one of them is that my mother's side was all from Quebec, and their records are really great, as you probably know. They were very dutiful about recording birth, deaths, and burials. And the other thing I'm thankful for was that there were a lot of bad actors in my family, so they showed up in the newspaper. <laughs> I know that sounds that sounds perverse, but if my family behaved well, I don't know if I'd know all of this. Philippe never married Marie. As the Depression hit, he found himself homeless and destitute. In the 1930 census, I found Philippe living in a rooming house in Philadelphia, and he was unemployed. Of course, it was the Depression. When Philippe was getting old and he was very sick, he went to his son, my grandmother's brother. Philippe abandoned all those kids, and he went to his son, Leonard, and said, will you take me in? And Leonard did. And I think that was a very forgiving thing on the part of Leonard that in the middle of the Depression, with four kids of his own and a wife, he takes in his ailing father, the father who abandoned him as a child. On Julianne's website, she says that it's stories like Graziella's and Philippe's that explain the addictive power of genealogy. Originally, she dipped her toe into the family history pool to try to learn more about her mother's behavior But as she entered her ancestors' world, she found threads that, when pulled, led to more and more unraveling of the family secrets. Her reaction to that may have even surprised her. You know, when you study your family history and you find bad news, you can take it a number of different ways. But my motivation for being a genealogist started with trying to figure out what really happened to mom as a child, because I just felt that there had been some trauma that explained some of her curiously insensitive things that she would say to me as she raised me. At some point, I resigned myself to the fact something happened to her, and her model for being a parent was a schizophrenic. So, you know, I just wanted to know more about what happened to mom, and I knew it would be sad. But When I put it all together, one of my reactions was of relief. I was relieved because things made sense. And, you know, at that point in my life, when I started genealogy, I was in my mid-50s, and I just wanted a family story that made sense. It's sad as it was. Things were starting to make sense now. Yes, genealogy can help make sense of what is happening today, because it sheds light and reveals truth about what came before and what was passed down, the good and the bad. I don't know about you, but for me, it has given me a tremendous amount of compassion 
for people, uh, even people where maybe I don't have an ongoing relationship with them, but I can look at their history and my history and say, I get why they live their life that way or behave the way that in which they do. And again, I can only speak personally, but I don't have to be angry about anybody or I don't have to be judgmental because that's their story. And it got put in context and it, and it makes more sense to me. And now I'm supposed to live mine, you know? Yeah, that's true. One of the things that I say repeatedly is that writing this book and writing the story of my family was a way of showing how family history is empowering and also it's got the potential to heal old wounds by bringing up the truth. There are many, many paths leading off of today's story. And if you'd like to read more of them, I encourage you to visit Julianne's website at juliannemangin.com. And our show notes webpage for this episode is a must visit this time. So head to genealogygems.com in the menu under podcast, click Genealogy Gems and navigate your way to episode 219. And there you'll find the infamous census record of Philippe, Marie, and Charles, a photo of Julianne with her mom and one of her with her mom's parents, and fabulous photo of Graziella's mother, Azilda Bonneau, with two of the orphaned Medi children. And you'll also find the research gems that we mentioned today and several resources for using them. If you are listening on the Genealogy Gems app, the show notes are conveniently right there for you. If you enjoyed this episode, I ask you kindly to do two things for me, okay? First, drop me an email at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com, or you can leave a voicemail at 925-272-4021. Send me your feedback. Would you like to hear more episodes like this? And second... Please share this episode with at least one other person, hopefully many more people. Facebook is a great place to do that, and it's super easy to do from the Genealogy Gems app. So on the episode screen you're looking at, 219, just tap the share icon. It appears right under the episode number and the date, and it kind of looks like three little dots connected by lines. Just tap that, and then you'll select Facebook from your list of apps to get this out in front of other people. And also share it with someone who just enjoys a good story or someone who's asked you, why in the world do you do all this genealogy stuff? And what difference does it make? Or maybe it's just someone who got turned off to podcast because the only one they've ever tried was just a bunch of blather. And those are definitely out there. They're kind of disorganized and people just shooting the breeze. And sometimes they can be a turnoff, but not all podcasts are like that. Be the one who turns them on to something that they're going to love and be inspired by. Because together, I think we can make a really positive impact. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon. 